Okay, so uh, we've been in this series of messages on conversations with Jesus, and uh, I realized that they started out uh, kind of light and uh, whimsical, and then they seem to have gotten heavier and heavier as we've gone along. And uh, I'm really sorry, but these were actually Jesus conversations, not mine. So I'm just I'm just reading them. Uh, but um, today, uh, I want us to look at one that is probably one of the most significant. Um, conversations that Jesus had in his, in his whole earthly ministry. And um, it may be that nothing is more important than, um, than this. And the weird thing is, it comes just before, I'm looking at John uh, chapter 14. John 13 ends with him talking about you know, who's going to betray him to his death. And then uh, he tells Peter he's going to betray him three times. He did all that, And then immediately says this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And then Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? He's kind of obnoxious in that way. Uh, and Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then at the very end of that chapter, the end of that conversation, he says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give to you like the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we might live in this world and in the next and, uh, and that we could do it without uh, being consumed in anxiety and fear. Teach us how to trust in God and to trust in you. And teach us to allow you to be our way. That's our need today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a, uh, a passage in the Bible that for 36 years I've been a pastor. I think I have read this at every graveside service, at every funeral, um, for 36 years. And I can say honestly that if you asked me exactly what it meant, I'd probably say, I don't know but I really am betting my life on it. I may not understand it all. I may not be able to explain the ipsy-pipsy details of how this is going to be, but I'm betting my life on this. And, uh, and so, um, so this is personal for me, too. Um, do not let your heart be troubled. That... Um, that sentence tells us so much because the fact is uh, every one of us carries some amount of anxiety, right? Some amount of tension, some amount of stress. Uh, we can't help it. In this world, uh, we're going to have stress, right? And then there's people who have anxiety disorders, so like my wife, you know, so for our whole life together and years before I ever came on the scene, just so you know I didn't cause it, uh, uh, years before um, she lives in, in a constant high level of anxiety and, uh, and fear. Um, medication now helps it come down a little bit, you know, so she's like at 60% um, what it was, so that's wonderful. But there's always anxiety. And so, um, so I thought about this, and I, I wanted to take this verse and tell her, as we were talking last night, and I wanted to tell her, look, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. So really, you're sinning if you're anxious. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to say that to the people you love? <laughs> what a sinner you are, because it says right here, don't let your hearts be troubled. So obviously, you're disobeying. If you had more faith, you wouldn't have anxiety disorder, right? <laughs> you know, I actually have been in church when I've heard those sermons, you know? So uh, there's a certain amount of guilt in it. So I was looking at this, though, and as I studied this, I realized something. And, and this showed me a couple of things. One, that, that Jesus, 
uh, when it says that he experienced all the things we experience, that that's true, and that secondly, he's saying this from very personal knowledge. And that is in the chapter just before, chapter 13, he's talking about being betrayed in verse 21. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. And it's the exact same Greek word that he uses, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is experiencing exactly what he's now calling us to be free from. Isn't that amazing? He knows what he's talking about. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And uh, trust in God, trust also in me. Not just, you know, some of this translation says, believe in God, believe also in me, which is, which is true, but, but it doesn't capture the whole thing of, of trusting, of, um, of centering your life in Christ and allowing uh, him to be Lord of your life, not just a belief that you have, yes, I believe in Jesus, uh, but what about that? And that's where it comes into, our, our, do we bet our life? That, that, uh, that God is who he says he is, and Jesus is there for us. And that's what the, where the trust comes in. Now, um, so I start thinking, okay, what is it that makes us uh, so stressful and so anxious at times? Um, I'm not, by the way, I'm not usually, I'm not an anxious person, which is really weird being married to someone who is. I mean, weird from her standpoint, because it means I never understand what, what she's going through or what she's experiencing. But over the years, I've talked with so many people who, who have issues with anxiety severely. Um, there's a couple of things that come out, commonalities. And one is that there's this sense in a person's mind, we get this idea in our mind of what might happen. And we then live in a tension of what if that, if it's a bad thing, then we live in when is that bad thing going to come? And so we live in this perpetual sense of, oh no, here it comes, here it comes, almost ominously. If it's a good thing, then we live in attention going towards the good thing of what if something happens and it doesn't come about. <laughs> so you get it either way, whether bad or good, you still have the anxiety and the tension in the middle of... And so I was thinking about it, and actually I was, I was talking with Eileen last night about this. And, um, and I said, what do you think is the root of it? And this was her answer. Um, I don't think that I'm important enough to God that it would matter what happened to me. Wow. I don't think I'm important to God. So therefore, I have all this fear and anxiety and actions and control and things because I don't think I'm important to God. And then the psychologist in me starts cranking, well, probably that came up and you were a kid, you know, and the way your family treated you, and you knew you weren't important, and, you know, all that stuff, which is irrelevant. But what happens if we discover that we are important to God, that we matter to God? Is it possible that that, that can give us freedom from our fear that God won't be there for us? When we get to the most important transition of our life, our, our own uh, dying and eternal life, and our entering into what no one's come back to tell us about, you know, except Jesus, uh, will we be important? Will we matter? Will we matter? I believe this may be one of the most important issues we can deal with to, and discovery we can make is that you matter to God. You're not an afterthought. You're not, uh, to quote the great philosophers, all we are is dust in the wind, dust in the wind, you know. That's old guy's philosophy. But um, 
How do we know we matter? So Jesus says, trust in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I'm not lying to you. I'm not keeping things from you. I'm not, you know, trying to keep secrets. Or I would have told you if this wasn't the case. I go to prepare a place for everybody else who's really important in the world, except you. Isn't that what he said? I should get this quote right. I'm going there to prepare a place for all the really good people who've got it together and who, who are faithful in their church attendance. And Let me get one more time. Okay. I go there to prepare a place for who? For you. For you. In other words, you matter. Jesus is going to prepare a place for you. It's not an accident. It's not indifference. I go to prepare a place for you. Now that, uh, that word, just so you know, that uh, in my uh, father's uh, home, many rooms, many mansions, we, we sang of that this morning, in mansions, of, remember that? Uh, that word in the Bible is used as a verb and as a noun. It's uh, in Greek, it's monet. And it, and it uses as a, as a verb when Jesus says, abide in me and I will abide in you. That word, monet, abide. Live in me. Have your, have your life in me and my life will be in you, right? And now he says, in my father's house are many monet, many places to abide. See? That's where we live. We're just we're going to dwell, just like we we abide in Christ and He abides in us. Our life is in Him. Uh, His life is in us. That that when we die here, that we still continue to abide in Christ and Him in us. Nothing changes, right? In my in my Father's house are many rooms, and I would have told you if it weren't so. I love that sentence. I just love that because it's so real. Now, is it okay to talk about stuff? Is it okay to do that here? Okay. <laughs> Can I get permission? Um, I don't handle um, death very well, okay? I don't handle my own death very well, and I sure am not going to handle yours, okay? So I'm just telling you that right now. Um, it, to me, it's, uh, it's one of those, uh, I wish I had more answers, and yet the answers I have, then I wish I, ha I believed them more, you know? You know that feeling? Uh, and. Uh, and so we were talking in the men's Bible study this week uh, about some of these things, and and uh, people were sharing how you know I just trust in God. He says God's who He says He is. I'm going to put my trust in Him. And I thought I'm doing that too, but I'm more doing it as an act of will than with confidence. You know, I'm 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 put uh, I'm betting I'm betting my life on this one. <laughs> okay, and Lord, you better be there. And if you're not. What am I going to do about it? You know, really, <laughs> frankly. So it's done. But there's something very profound about coming to grips with what it means that um, eternal life doesn't start when we die here. Some people think, okay, we're going to have our life and then we die and then we'll have eternal life. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that when, when, when we have this relationship with Jesus Christ and we abide in him, that that's just going to continue. We'll continue to abide in him and him in us. And so our eternal life has already begun. Like it or not, you are already have eternal life. And... You know, whether, whether you segue in, uh, you know, 50 years or you segue in uh, five minutes, I hope you don't because I got more in the sermon, but uh, if you do, you know, we'll deal with it, right? Uh, our eternal life doesn't change. And our belonging to Christ doesn't change. There, there's a passage that I 
that I love. In fact, I love it so much, I think I've shown you this, it's, um, it's the pages are torn out of my Bible. This, this is where it is. Okay. So, oh, no. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Like those butterflies in the Robin Williams movies, they just kind of show up and... Never mind. Uh, so... <laughs> no kidding, this is... Talk about it. I know, I should invest in a new Bible. But this is the preaching Bible. This is what it says here in uh, 2 Corinthians. Therefore, therefore, we do not lose heart. Get that? We do not lose heart. Though outwardly... We're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, so, we fix our eyes not on what's seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Right? That's what we do. And now, you know, we're wasting away on the outside, but on the inside we're being renewed. I love that, that picture. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in, in people's lives uh, over the years. I've seen people who, th their spirits are becoming stronger and their, and their faith is becoming stronger as they're getting weaker. Isn't that strange? Um, people's whole personalities can change as they, as they begin to take hold of Christ in a new way and let go of their physical life here in a new way. That's an interesting thing that happens. Um, now, Jesus uh, says an interesting thing here. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back, my translation says, and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. Some of your other translations say, um, to receive you unto myself, right? And that suddenly caught me this week. Never thought of this before. This is a new thing. It could be wrong, but it's Westphalian new. So here we go. All my life, I have been taught, and I've believed, and I have preached this and shared it at camps and conferences and churches. I agree that, that we need to receive Jesus Christ into our hearts and lives. We need to ask Christ to come into our lives and begin that relationship. You ever heard that before? Good. Okay, so we've talked about that. And I believe that my whole life. Central. And I even think of that verse in Re Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in, right? And I have hung on to that, and I believe that. I say, Lord, you know, you and me, because I have accepted you, and I have received you. Therefore, I'm okay. I don't know about these other people, you know, at Harbor Church. They may not make it, but Lord, you know, I'm going to make it, because I have received you. Then I look at this, and what does Jesus tell us? I go to prepare a place for you, and then when I come again, I will receive you unto myself. He turns the whole thing around. Have you ever thought of Jesus receiving you like you received him? That I will, I will take you to be with me. In other words, he's opening a door that we can go into. I love that image. It just, it hit me this week. And I went, you know, we've been stressing about are we going to receive Christ? And I'm going, I forgot that he receives us. And then he wants to, and that's, that's what he's doing. And he's preparing a place for us so that, so that he'll be welcoming us as our physical life here ends. And he'll be there to receive us. Um, 
I watched my mom die, uh, and I've talked about this with you some. Um, she was someone who was a little bit wacky, you know, um, never diagnosed wacky, but, um, but I knew she was, and uh, she had a very strong lifetime discomfort of talking intimately and honestly. That was difficult for her, which you know, probably made it hard for her to sit and listen to my sermons, because I'm always, you know, I say things, uh, you know, before I think them. But, um, and usually there's uh, no thoughts unexpressed, and so sometimes she'd go, wow, do you have to talk about the family, you know? Uh, <laughs> Her dad ran the Hollywood Park racetrack, so um, he never spoke of his work ever my whole life with my grandpa. We never had a conversation. But she was never comfortable with anything personal in sharing. And if ever she did share something personal, the next time we talked, she would say, no, no, that wasn't true. You must, I never said that. Until she found out she had a year to live. And when she was told that, something began to change in her. And what changed was she started to become solid instead of wacky. She wasn't afraid of personal conversations anymore. She wasn't afraid of intimacy. She wasn't afraid of, of anything. She had this peace that allowed her to be real. And so I feel like what a gift the last year of her life I got a real mother, you know, well, that was a great gift to me. So uh, I called her up, I knew she was towards the end and I was in Minnesota, so I called her up and said, you know, I think I'm going to come out next week, maybe next Tuesday, and she said, no, come in two days. Okay, that's going to be an expensive air ticket, Mom, <laughs> you sure? <laughs> yeah, use points, come out in two days. So, uh, here's Miles, so we did. And uh, I got there and, you know, we had those talks. Um, I told you about how I asked her what she was most afraid of. So we sat on the couch and held hands and she said, I'm afraid that the pain is gonna get so great towards the end that I'm gonna become a crabby, mean, yelling person and that's all anybody remembers, how mean I am. And then when she died, the next morning we found the unopened bottle of pain pills. Hadn't taken one. Her biggest fear never materialized. Now, I, I found her actually uh, when, when she died and um, laying in bed, my dad said, you know, why don't you go wake her up, tell her you have to go to the airport. So I went in and I went, I think she's too medicated. She's not responding. <laughs> I think she's drugged. <laughs> and he came in and we sat there and went, no, she's gone. I, you know, I didn't even notice it. I didn't recognize it. And, uh, and so my dad and I stood there by the bed and, and we cried together and, and I said, did anything, did she say anything last night? And he said, well, not really. It was, it was kind of strange, you know, I, I got up with her in the middle of the night and, and took her to the bathroom and she kept saying, I can't turn out the light. And I got mad and I started saying, I turned out the light. I turned it out, it's not on. But I, I can't turn out the light. And he said, she got back in bed and, and kept mama, I can't turn out the light. And, and I kept saying, will you just go to sleep? <laughs> My dad's like me, you know, <laughs> Mr. Sensor. And, and I, I did it, I did it, there, there's no light, I turned out the light. I, I can't turn out the light. And now in hindsight, I look at that and I go, that's right, that's right. You think you don't matter to God? You don't think that you matter to Jesus? You think that uh, you have to be anxious and, and, and disturbed in your heart because uh, you don't know what's going to happen? You matter to him. And when that time comes, you might say, I can't turn out the light. And that is absolutely true because he is coming to receive you. He's coming to receive you just like you received him. and to welcome you home, to abide with you. You abide with him. I think when we come to grips with the fact that we cannot turn out the light, even in our death, we cannot turn out the light. Then when he says this, peace I leave with you, 
my peace, I give it to you. Not like the world's. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I think we can claim that then. And we can say, Lord, as you've come into my life, now I come into your life. So Lord, call us to you. Call us to you in every situation we find ourselves. Help us to see your light. Help us to see your love. Help us to see your presence. We thank you that you don't leave us confused. You don't leave us in lurch. And you certainly don't leave us unimportant. Your love shows that we matter to you. So we give everything to you as you've given everything to us. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.